Real estate agents are often put in vulnerable situations. They regularly meet up with potential clients who are usually strangers and empty homes. They hope to show the house and maybe make a sale as a way to support their family. Today, many real estate agents and companies have safety protocols in place to protect themselves. But unfortunately, they can still find themselves in precarious situations with people who wish to do them harm, especially young women. Welcome back. So this week I thought I'd cover a cold case from Victoria, British Columbia, the 2008 murder of Lindsay Buziak. She was a 24-year-old woman just doing her job, showing a house to a man and a woman who wanted to see it. After luring her to the house, they attacked her in an upstairs bedroom. And after almost 15 years, we still don't know why Lindsay was targeted and who did this to her. Lindsay Elizabeth Buziak was born in Victoria, British Columbia on November 2nd, 1983 to Jeff and Evelyn Buziak. She had a sister named Sarah and both attended Lake Hill Elementary and Reynolds High School. After she graduated, she studied for her real estate license and became an agent at the Maverick Real Estate Corporation. She was described by her uncle as a vivacious young woman, full of life, with a wild group of loyal friends. She was also one of the youngest of 1,300 real estate agents working in her area. In 2008, Lindsay moved in with her boyfriend, Jason Zalo, and started to work for Remax, where Jason's mother, Shirley Zalo, worked as the manager. At the end of January 2008, Lindsay received a strange call on her cell phone from a Vancouver number. She told her boyfriend it was a woman with a strong Spanish-sounding-like accent. The call also came through on her personal cell phone, not her work phone. Lindsay then asked the woman how she got her cell phone number. And the woman told her that someone had referred her, but then never said who it was. Referrals are a huge part of a realtor's business, and at the very minimum, Lindsay would need to thank the person who allegedly recommended her. But when she called around to ask other clients, no one knew anything about it. The woman on the phone said her husband had just been transferred to Victoria and they were in need of a million dollar home in a quiet neighborhood. The house needed to be at least three bedrooms, three bathrooms, and have room for a live-in maid. Lindsay was initially suspicious of the call. Her boyfriend Jason felt the same way too. He felt it was too good to be true. And Lindsay had questions about the call, like why the woman had chosen her in the first place. After all, she was a new real estate agent with limited experience. The very next day, the woman's husband called Lindsay to say that he would be looking at houses alone because his wife was unavailable. Lindsay told her colleagues that she was not comfortable with this. Something just didn't seem right. But her broker at the time didn't have a policy about showing properties alone, or have any record of the potential buyer before the showing. Saanich police would later determine that Lindsay had 10 more phone calls with that suspicious Vancouver phone number before her death. If the couple provided a name, for some reason, Lindsay never wrote down the name of the callers. She simply had the phone number saved in her phone under the name Million Dollars. Over the next few days, she planned to show the couple a number of homes, all vacant and all new. On Friday, February 1st, 2008, Lindsay emailed the buyers some suggestions for houses to look at. After the email, police believed there was a 10-minute phone call, during which she gave them the address, 1702 D'Souza Place, in the Gordon Head development. The house was listed for 964000 and located in the town of Saanich. That Friday night, Lindsay was apparently extremely nervous about the viewing scheduled for the next day. Jason allegedly told her not to get too excited. He thought the call was a little suspicious and wasn't even sure the caller was going to show up. Around 7.15 that Friday evening, Shirley Zalo stopped by to visit her son, and she overheard Lindsay talking with the potential buyer for about 15 minutes, but she never heard exactly what was said. Lindsay had planned to meet the caller and her husband at the home at 5.30 p.m., just after the sun had set. In the time leading up to the showing, Lindsay appears to have been feeling increasingly anxious. The commission from the sale would be significant, likely thousands of dollars. And according to a letter allegedly from a friend, Lindsay was stressed about money. 
There was also the issue of her friend's bachelorette party. It was in Vancouver on Saturday night, but the mysterious couple wanted to see houses late into Saturday evening and again throughout Sunday, meaning Lindsay would most likely miss the party. Lindsay was still awake around midnight Friday night when Jason returned home from playing hockey. He offered, as he apparently had done before, to do the showing for Lindsay. He and Lindsay had met at the same real estate course in 2006, and Jason was a licensed broker. As Lindsay was still uneasy about the showing, he reminded her that she received a similar call from a woman about a month earlier, and that the client's budget had been almost identical, 900000 and in that case, the mysterious call ended with a sale. Although, I do have questions about Jason offering to do the showing. Does he have proof to back this up? Like witnesses that may have overheard him, text messages or emails? Or are the police just taking his word from his statement? Because the Saanich police have been extremely tight-lipped about sharing information with the public, I don't have answers for this. In the days before the showing, there were also odd things happening with Lindsay's online activity. And the police saw that there were missing chat messages, although they were unable to determine when those messages had been deleted. Facebook was still pretty new at the time, and the Saanich police noticed that from January 24th, 2008 to February 3rd, 2008, there were absolutely no messages from Lindsay's 700 Facebook friends. This time frame was basically two weeks before her death and one day after. And she was extremely active on Facebook, like she posted daily, so investigators considered this odd. On Lindsay's list of Facebook friends, police saw people who were violent criminals. And Saanich police initially believed that Lindsay's association to them may have played a role in her death. In December 2007, Lindsay took a four-day trip to Calgary to visit her father, but while there, also visited with friends. At least one of those friends was involved in a major drug bust shortly after Lindsay's death. On February 2nd, the day of the showing, Lindsay stopped by the Remax office where she worked. According to the receptionist, Lindsay was there between 3 and 4 p.m. This was later confirmed to be the wrong time as Lindsay was having lunch with Jason between 3 and 4 p.m. However, the receptionist did say that Lindsay seemed really freaked out and feeling very weird about the showing. Lindsay gave the receptionist and another coworker the phone number she had saved in her phone as million dollar to see if they could find a record with other agents in Victoria, but nothing came back. Afterwards, she met Jason for a late lunch at a restaurant around 3.30 p.m. Jason told police that he once again made the offer to handle the showing for Lindsay during lunch, but she insisted on doing it. He paid the bill at the restaurant at 4.20 p.m., and afterwards it's believed that Lindsay went home to change for her appointment. She apparently planned on attending both the showing and the Vancouver bachelorette party. While she was getting ready for the showing, Jason went to SCH Auto Graphics, an auto shop five minutes away from where they were having lunch. The owners had apparently hired Lindsay to help sell a property, and Jason seems to have gone there to present an offer. He arrived at the shop at 4.29 p.m., according to CCTV footage from the shop. While he was there, Jason called Lindsay and offered to meet her at the house. He apparently had paperwork from the SCH real estate deal that needed her signature. Jason said that Lindsay agreed to meet him, but still wanted to do the showing by herself. Shortly after Jason called Lindsay, he got a call from his friend Cohen Oatman, who was supposed to be meeting him for dinner that evening. According to Oatman's statement to police, his cell phone battery had died and he called Jason from a payphone in town. The two decided to go to the home together to wait for Lindsay. Oatman drove to the SCH parking lot. He left his vehicle there and got into Jason's 2005 Range Rover. Security footage shows them leaving SCH around 5.30 p.m. Jason tried to find the address of the home using his vehicle's navigation system, but it didn't work. So he called Lindsay to ask for directions. The couple looking at the home had apparently just arrived at the house, and Lindsay had to cut the conversation short. Her last words to him were, quote, Oh, I've got to go. They're here. Jason then told her to text him the address. 
The text came through shortly afterwards, and Jason responded by letting Lindsay know that he was on his way. But that last text message Jason sent to Lindsay would never be opened. Jason and Cohen arrived at the house around 5.45 p.m. As they were turning onto the street, Jason is said to have seen a male figure through one of the house's front door windows. He also told officers that while he waited, he saw a man and a woman open the front door and then close it. Police seemed to be satisfied that the killers were attempting to leave through the front door, but got spooked when Jason drove up to the property. So they snuck out the back instead, leaving the patio door open. Police theorized that they snuck through a fence back to their vehicle, which was most likely parked somewhere on or near Torque Drive. This is consistent with witness statements of seeing an unknown couple walking in the area, as well as the house being shown was on a cul-de-sac and all the cars in that area were accounted for. According to police, the man and the woman were Caucasian. Witnesses say the woman was about 35 to 40 years old, with shorter blonde hair and wearing a strangely memorable dress. And as for the man, he is described as about six feet tall with possibly brown hair and was wearing a brown jacket that fell below his waist. When Jason pulled onto the street, he texted and called Lindsay's cell. Her black BMW was in the driveway, he noticed, but there were no other cars on the road. For about 10 minutes, Jason and Cohen waited and watched. The front door was closed and locked, which Jason thought was odd. He then rang the doorbell about 10 times, but there was no answer. Jason and Cohen then walked to the back of the house. They looked for a basement entrance, but found it in darkness. They returned to the front yard and peered in the windows. Lindsay had unlocked the house with a lockbox, and Jason assumed she must have taken it inside the house with her, preventing anyone else from entering. Jason noticed the for sale sign on the lawn, which had the office number for the real estate agent, not their personal cell number. It was after hours, so Jason called his mother to get a direct line for the house's listing agent, who was also one of Lindsay's colleagues. He also paged the agent to ask for the passcode for the garage. Around 6.05 p.m., Jason called 911. According to the transcripts from that call, he explained that he and his girlfriend were both realtors and that she was meeting a female client from out of town. Through the front window, Jason could see the heels that Lindsay had removed prior to walking through the house. After hanging up, Jason and Cohen walked to the side of the house and for the first time noticed a large, almost completely enclosed patio. They looked over the fence and saw an open back door, at which point they began to panic. Jason boosted his friend over the fence before running back to the front door and Cohen went through the inside of the house and unlocked the front door for Jason. Jason and Cohen then began to do a sweep of the house. Cohen covered the first floor while Jason ran up to the second. Lindsay was in the master bedroom at the top of the stairs. She had been stabbed repeatedly more than 40 times. As soon as Jason found her, he called down to Cohen, who made a second call to 911 around 6.11 p.m. According to the summary of Cohen's phone call, he said that he and Jason entered the house, saw bloody footprints, and found Lindsay lying in a pool of blood. Police would later say that she had been attacked between 5.38 and 5.41 p.m. when her Blackberry made an accidental call. This is corroborated by the coroner's report, which puts her time of death around 5.40 p.m., five minutes before Jason and Cohen showed up. The official cause of death was determined to be blood loss, caused from multiple stab wounds. When the police arrived, Jason was taken down to the station for an interview. The house was searched and the surrounding area was searched with a canine unit. According to the Times columnist, police have never confirmed if they found a murder weapon. The police then immediately looked into the phone used to contact Lindsay. It was prepaid and had never been used to contact anybody else. The name used to register the phone was Palio Rodriguez, which the police later determined to be a fake name. Whoever was responsible had been planning this for a while. Police said the cell phone used by the killers to set up the appointment was bought weeks before the murder in late 2007. 
and activated over the internet less than 48 hours before the murder. The cell phone was purchased in Vancouver and used exclusively for this crime. And when the phone was activated, it traveled from the Vancouver area to Greater Victoria, sometime in the 24 hours before Buziak's murder. The phone used to contact Lindsay, as well as the person or persons presumed to be her killer, then traveled to the island using BC ferries. And after hanging up from the call, the killer may have used MapQuest for the purpose of familiarizing themselves with the area and planning an escape route. Based on cell tower information, police appear to know the area where the cell phone was purchased and where the person or people who used the phone were most likely from. The phone was deactivated soon after the murder and has not been used since. On February 6, Jason Zalo returned to the crime scene with his lawyer. As the police videotaped him, he walked the officers through the home and answered their questions. I pushed it open. Okay. Uh, um, he was already in front of me. Yeah. And I said, I'm running upstairs. Okay. And so I was yelling, I was yelling, I'm like, Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay. And where did Cohen go? He went straight ahead. He went straight ahead? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just hang on a sec there. Uh, yeah. The family of Jason Zalo were also investigated due to their connections with the cul de sac. D'Souza Court is named after developer Joe D'Souza a friend and business associate of Shirley Zalo. A section of the cul-de-sac was still under construction at the time of the murder. And D'Souza was in the area supervising construction work an hour before the murder. However, police have stated that no one in the Zalo family is a suspect. But later in 2008, a close friend of Lindsay's called Nikki claimed that she was awakened by a telephone call in the middle of the night by an unknown number. As she was half asleep, she didn't really remember much of what the female caller was saying. But she did notice that the caller had a strange accent that she could not place. She became scared when she remembered that Lindsay had reported that her unidentified client, and possibly murderer, had an odd accent that she could not put a finger on. Now fully awake, she called the number back, but nobody picked up. She called the number repeatedly about 20 or 30 times until finally somebody answered. The person on the other end of the line was Shirley Zalo. Nikki asked Shirley why she called her and how she had her number as the two didn't know each other. Shirley replied that she meant to call another Nikki, her secretary, and that she didn't know why this Nikki was in her contact list, but assumed that her son Jason must have been the one who added it. Shirley denies that this event ever took place, and it's never been publicly revealed whether Nikki's claims were followed up on by police. Right after the murder, police were quick to say that public tips weren't needed to solve the case. A month after the killing, the family considered putting up a reward, but the police told them they had sufficient information and there was no need to do so. But after one year of trying, police finally admitted that they were at a dead end and needed help. They wasted a whole year while they could have been using the media and the public to chase leads. They were publicly referring to this case as a whodunit. One year into the investigation, police had conducted 1,471 interviews. They had investigated 752 tips and executed 30 search warrants looking for evidence. They searched the condo where Lindsay and Jason lived and collected dozens of footprints from real estate agents and clients in an attempt to weed out suspects from legitimate prospective home buyers. On February 4th, 2009, one year after Lindsay's murder, police released a composite sketch of one of the suspects they believed to be involved in her murder. The sketch was of a Caucasian woman between the ages of 35 and 45 with short blonde hair. Police also gave a description of a male suspect, believed to be Caucasian, six feet with dark hair and a light jacket. Both were well dressed, with the woman wearing a black designer skirt or dress with red and white stripes. The composite descriptions were put together from statements from several witnesses. 
Police released the sketch a year and a day after the killing, hoping that renewed media interest in the case would, quote, maximize public exposure. Why did they hang on to this sketch for a year? Wouldn't releasing it right away maximize public exposure? When asked why police didn't release the information sooner, police said, quote, they wanted to ensure that it met with our investigative needs. According to criminologist Robert Gordon at Simon Fraser University, police usually release a sketch as quickly as possible in a criminal investigation, and also said that if they had been sitting on this sketch for over a year, the release of the sketch suggests two possible situations. They either have an inside track on who the woman in the sketch was, and they don't want to spoil that, or they don't have a suspect at all. After releasing the sketch, police received more than 50 calls to their tip line immediately afterwards. Police also admitted that one year after the murder, Jason Zalo, Lindsay's boyfriend, was officially cleared as a suspect. Other than the sketch being released, the Saanich police remained extremely uncommunicative about the case. They constantly refused to answer questions about possible motives or suspects, arguing that they needed to protect their investigation. And Jeff Buziak has been openly critical about their lack of progress. Quote, Saanich police are not capable. They are not qualified. They have no experience. They never should have been on this case by themselves. This needs to be turned over completely to the RCMP. In 2010, in an interview with the Times columnist, Jeff Buziak said that two local private investigators were also investigating her murder, and that two years afterwards, Saanich police were no closer to making an arrest. He said the inability of the Saanich investigators to arrest the people behind his daughter's murder has left him no choice but to act. Detective Chris Horsley, one of the 10 major crime investigators working the file, admitted publicly that she could have been targeted by hired professional killers. Quote, This is completely different from other homicides, in the sense that we have people who have been sent or hired to set up the victim. This makes the investigation extremely complicated. Okay, if the police believe these were contract killers, contracted by whom? And why? Around the two-year anniversary of Lindsay's murder, her family announced a reward of $100,000 for information leading to the arrest of the suspect. And Jeff Buziak said he was frustrated by the lack of answers coming from the police. Quote, The police know who did it. I know who did it. This isn't some complicated big scenario. This is a local girl slaughtered in a house doing her job because someone was mad at her. By 2010, Saanich investigators had followed leads in the Lower Mainland, Calgary, on the East Coast, and even in Washington State. They also ordered warrants for online conversations and poured over cell phone records, but the key question that police have yet to answer is why. When Lindsay was killed, there was nothing in her background that could make her a target. Police also said that the brutal nature of the slaying might have been intended to make it appear to be a crime of passion or to send a message to someone. He also warned that private investigators as well as Jeff Buziak could be putting themselves in danger if they got too involved in the case. Jeff Buziak said that the private investigators had narrowed their list down to five suspects, saying that he knew the motive but would only speak about it vaguely. But then in June of 2010, police came up with a new theory that the killer's hit could have been a mistake, that Lindsay could have been a victim of misinformation. Detective Horsley said that the details of her murder pointed to a high level of sophistication and planning by her killer or killers, right down to leaving no electronic tracks beyond the cell phone that was only used to communicate with Lindsay and was immediately discarded. There is also very little forensic evidence found at the crime scene. All the DNA evidence extracted from the house, which had been professionally cleaned the day of the killing, was traced back to Lindsay. Investigators obtained volumes of data from cell phone towers in Vancouver and Victoria to look for matches between the cell phone used by the suspect and other cell phone transmission. But police were unable to find a match that might provide information leading to the identification of the killer. 
investigators know exactly the movements the killer made throughout the home after the attack, including that they left through the French doors at the back of the house that Jason discovered open around 6.15 p.m. and said that the killers left the home immediately after the slaying. Police also combed through Lindsay's financial records and online social network chats and found nothing to indicate a motive. Stabbing, though, is not really an ideal way to pull off a murder for hire. With stabbing, there are way higher chances of leaving DNA behind. She suffered dozens of stab wounds to her head and chest and had no defensive wounds. Police theorized that she was stabbed from behind, which would explain her lack of defensive wounds. But she had dozens of stab wounds on her chest. If she had dozens of stab wounds on her chest... What about the possibility that she was restrained by one of her captors? Also, if this was a murder for hire plot, who would benefit from her death? Or who was angry enough to want her dead? Murder for hire isn't exactly cheap either. Who has that kind of money lying around? Also, the murder took place at dusk, so wouldn't all the lights in the house be on while Lindsay was showing the house? And the house was empty. There were no curtains on these windows. So anyone standing on the street would be able to see straight into the house. I know this was a quiet street, but there is a massive window in the master bedroom where Lindsay's body was discovered, and nobody apparently saw anything. Also, didn't anyone in the neighborhood hear anything? It's a little strange. She was stabbed between 30 to 40 times, and no one in the neighborhood reported hearing a woman screaming. It just seems highly suspicious. That's all I'm saying. In September of 2010, the TV show Dateline covered Lindsay Buziak's murder, resulting in about 160 tips shortly after the show aired, with some calls coming as far away as Hawaii. However, most of these tips were more or less theories and weren't very helpful. There was some information, though, that was never disclosed to the public. Six weeks before her death, Lindsay had traveled to Calgary, and while there, reconnected with two male friends. One month later, one of the men was charged in relation to the largest cocaine bust in Alberta. Also found stashed in his home was over $200,000 in cash. Lindsay was not an informant, but there was a theory presented that she might have saw something that put her life in danger. The detectives investigated the possibility, but it was quickly ruled out as a motive. Because she was not an informant and the personal nature of her murder did not fit a hired killer's method of operation. Crime scene investigator Yolanda McClary and veteran homicide detective Dwayne Statton both agree that Lindsay's murder was not a contracted murder related to a drug cartel. They say it was brutal but too amateurish. Both seasoned investigators stated that they believe Lindsay's murder was very personal and planned by someone close to her. Someone who had access to inside information from the Remax office where she worked. Shortly after the Dateline program aired, the Saanich police took the unusual steps to announce that they were satisfied that Jason Zalo's brother Ryan and mother Shirley had nothing to do with Lindsay's death, saying that they hoped to end the quote, Finger pointing, rumor, speculation, and innuendo by clearing the Zalo family. Jeff Buziak, in the meantime, had made it his mission to solve his daughter's murder. He believes there is someone out there with key pieces of information. Quote, What I believe happened was Lindsay knew information about certain people that was a threat to their lifestyle. And so they ended her life rather than taking the chance she would expose them. We do know it was somebody who knows her, someone close to her, and we know certainly more than one individual is involved. Those facts are certainly well established. In February of each year, Jeff Buziak leads an annual walk in remembrance of Lindsay and to keep her case in the public eye. In the year 2020, 12 years after Lindsay's murder, the Saanich police were still staying quiet about the case saying they will not speak to journalists or release any information on what they characterize as an open and active investigation. Jeff Buziak, on the other hand, refuses to stop talking, saying, quote, There are conspirators and killers of a young woman walking free in Greater Victoria. The public is in danger. 
The Lindsay Buziak case is one of Canada's highest profile unsolved murders and even inspired a petition to have the Spanish police removed from the investigation. Things took a very strange turn in 2021 when it was announced that the FBI would be joining the investigation, which is odd because the FBI has no jurisdiction in Canada. Saanich police say that the new task force includes representatives from the FBI as well as continued support from the RCMP. They also stated that technology developed since Lindsay's death has highlighted additional leads and forensic evidence. Advancements in fields such as genealogy and DNA analysis has led to resolutions in many other cases. Investigators are reviewing and retesting evidence, including items from the crime scene as well as digital evidence. Technology not available at the time of the crime has allowed us to develop new investigative leads. This whole thing is very weird because the very few times that the Saanich police have been willing to speak to reporters, they have led them to believe there was no DNA evidence left behind. And now they're saying there could be. In most murder cases, police will keep some details quiet. It's known as holdback evidence. These are things that only the killer would know. Investigators also announced that they were speaking to all possible suspects. What suspects? I didn't think they had any. At this point in the story, it's 13 years into this thing, and the police have kept quiet about any possible suspects. Other than the sketch of the woman they released the year after the crime, and the vague description of the man she was with. They've refused to speak publicly about any possible suspects and only said that they've cleared a few people. That's it. Rob Gordon of Simon Fraser University's School of Criminology said that he's puzzled by the FBI's involvement, noting it's not as if, quote, they have magical special powers of investigation or special equipment. The RCMP also has a forensic lab and do DNA analysis. All of this is true. There's only one reason I can think of as to why the FBI is now involved. It's so they can gather and access information that's relevant to one of their own unsolved files. The police overall just seemed a little overly confident in this press conference, saying that the people with key details could be ready to talk now. Quote, we believe people familiar with the circumstances surrounding the case remain in the community. It's not too late to come forward. Is anyone else as confused as I am? In the beginning, detectives were completely 100% confident that this was a professional hit, while also believing that the murder was personal due to the brutal nature of the crime. And yet they also believed that the murder was executed amateurishly. How does this make any sense, and wouldn't this help narrow down the suspects? Who did she personally know who would be familiar enough with real estate and the real estate business, yet also be angry enough at her to carry out a professional yet amateurish murder? The whole case is disturbing, as she was definitely targeted, but why? In 2020, the Capitol Daily published a piece about the Lindsay Buziak case. They petitioned the BC Supreme Court to unseal 35 applications. The documents revealed previously unknown details of the case, including that Lindsay's online activity mysteriously dropped off in the days before her death, and that police appeared to know far more about the phone used to contact Lindsay than previously disclosed. In 2022, things took a slightly weird turn. Shirley Zalo filed a civil claim in BC Supreme Court on April 25th, alleging she had been defamed by three people. One of the people she's suing includes Lindsay's father, Jeff Buziak. Shirley Zalo claims that she has been subjected to relentless online attacks on lindsaybuziakmurder.com, a website allegedly owned and operated by Jeff Buziak. According to Jeff Buziak, he says he wasn't surprised about the lawsuit, saying, quote, Shirley has been one of my biggest enemies and said she has not cooperated with him in trying to solve Lindsay's murder. On a July 18th Facebook post, Jeff Buziak announced that Zonta Research Group of Vancouver has been hired to both look into the murder itself and to support Jeff Buziak's defense against the defamation lawsuit filed against him by Shirley Zalo. 
As part of its investigation, Zonta has launched an online tip line for anyone who may have information related to the case, and I will leave that link in the description box down below. I'll also post the link to Jeff Buziak's GoFundMe campaign that he launched to help pay for Zonta services. So almost 15 years into this thing, that's about where we are right now. The case doesn't seem to be any closer to being solved than it was in 2008. But there's more public attention on this case than ever before, and it's not going away. Someone out there knows something. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed learning about this case, please be sure to like and subscribe. To support my channel, you can go to Buy Me A Coffee if you'd like to donate. All the links to my socials are in the description box down below. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.